60 Mariners, 60 events, one ultimate virtual baseball party. Welcome to the Mariners Virtual Baseball Bash Preview Show. Now, here's your host, Aaron Goldsmith. Hi there, my name is Aaron Goldsmith, one of the Mariners broadcasters, and welcome to the first ever Mariners Virtual Baseball Bash Preview Show. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be bringing you some fantastic Mariners content. If you can believe it, we are just weeks away from pitchers and catchers reporting in Peoria, Arizona. We are just over 70 days away from opening day. The Mariners taking on the San Francisco Giants right here at gorgeous T-Mobile Park. Well, over the next two weeks, we're going to have some Twitter takeovers. We're going to hit all of our social media platforms. You'll hear from Mariners players, from Mariners coaches, from a number of different media members as well. As for the next two weeks, we're going to bring you some awfully unique Mariners content. For you to keep up to date with the entire schedule of all the things we'll bring, be bringing your way over the next two weeks, hope you can join our Mariners mail subscription list. Just go to mariners.com slash mail and we'll keep you up to date on everything coming your way over the next two weeks. Well, among the things that we'll be bringing you, because normally this time of the week we'd have Mariners players and Scott Service, Mariners manager, Jared Apoto, Mariners general manager here talking to the media and a number of media sessions. Since that's not happening, we're going to bring those to you, our Mariners fans, virtually. So right now we'll give to you the upcoming schedule of Mariners media sessions coming your way. This week's media sessions get started at the conclusion of this program as Jerry Depoto sits down to discuss the offseason, spring training, and the upcoming 2021 campaign. Then on Thursday at 11 a.m., you can catch J.P. Crawford, Marco Gonzalez, and Kyle Seeger talk about the upcoming season as they look to make some noise in the AL West. Both media sessions can be viewed on Mariners.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. Be sure to visit Mariners.com slash Baseball Bash for updates and schedules for the entire week ahead. In 2020, we saw our first wave of young talent for the Mariners hit the major leagues. Guys like J.P. Crawford, Justice Sheffield, Justin Dunn, and many others. We expect to see plenty of new faces as well in 2021. And to get you excited for the season, our very first Mariners commercial for the upcoming season. Last season... Baseball's youngest team led the American League in stolen bases and was one of the top defensive clubs in the game. Holy smokes, Kyle Lewis! Featured two gold glovers in the infield. Are you kidding? That was gorgeous! Evan Wyman wow. making the catch! Plus another with the hardware in his trophy case. What a play! Don't forget, the unanimous AL Rookie of the Year. God home run, Kyle Lewis! You cannot stop number one. And top rookie starter. Justice Sheffield strikes out the side. With the Bulldog atop the rotation. Bulldog tough, you bet. Oh, and throw in one of baseball's best farm systems. And we've got one question. Are you ready for more? Mariners baseball, see us rise. Uh, tell me that doesn't get you fired up. Well, we hope that you're already following many of the Mariners' social media channels. Hope you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, TikTok, and more. And to give you an idea as to some of the player takeovers that we'll be seeing on our social media channels in this upcoming week, we'll take a look at that schedule. Starting this afternoon, the Mariners have an exciting lineup of Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok takeovers scheduled for you to be a part of. First, catch Mariners prospect Taylor Trammell as he takes over Mariners Twitter at 3 this afternoon. Tomorrow at 3, you can join Mariners field coordinator Carson Vitale on Instagram as he takes us on a jog and shares his goal to raise money for the United Way by running 3,650 miles in 2021. Then at 4, head over to Twitter as farm system standout San De La Plain logs in to interact with Mariners fans everywhere. Thursday's action kicks off with a Twitter takeover from Mariners second baseman Shed Long Jr. at 2. Then wraps up on TikTok, where hard-throwing prospect Sam Carlson takes control at 3. The week concludes with back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back takeovers on Friday. First, catch one of the top young lefties in baseball as Justice Sheffield hops on Instagram at 2 p.m. Afterwards, make your way over to Twitter, where the always entertaining Joey Gerber is taking over. To finish your week, join us back on Instagram for a Q&A session with all-star outfielder Mitch Hanniger as he mans the grill for dinner. 
Be sure to follow the Mariners across our social media platforms to tune in and use the hashtag Baseball Bash while you're there. We'll see you then. Well, what a jam-packed week. A lot coming up. And what better person to talk about that than we bring in the one and only Kevin Martinez from inside Mariners Marketing and Communications. And Kevin, first of all, we are very socially distant. Good thing we uh, cleaned this up. You look great through this pex plexiglass. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. We're staying safe. That's, that's the important thing. That's absolutely right. Hey, this is a, a really fun and cool idea to bring all kinds of unique Mariners content to our fan base all across the world. How, Kevin, tell us, how did the Mariners virtual baseball bash come to be? Yeah, and, uh, you know, the idea is exactly that. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a party for our fans to, to start celebrating the return of baseball. But after the season ended and everything that we went through and everything uh, that we learned in such a unique year, um, we, we knew that we would likely be challenged to put on events like FanFest and our pre-spring training media luncheon and all the events that we have done traditionally in January and February. Um, we said, you know what? We might not be able to bring fans together. How do we uh, celebrate the game of baseball and give fans the access to our players, our coaches, our manager, our GM, uh, and our staff. And uh, through just a number of uh, uh, conversations in October and early November, we came up with this, really this two-week to three-week celebration of Mariners baseball. And we think, Aaron, that the virtual baseball bash may give more access, you know, in some ways, sure than ever before and we've had a great response from our players uh alumni um, and, and staff and coaches so we're really excited about the access that fans will have uh beginning today and it's not just one platform it's all the platforms let's start with today how can fans uh, take part of this yeah well it's it's going to get underway with a media session with jerry depoto fans can log on and watch mariners uh watch this all at mariners Dot com. He'll give us the landscape of the organization, where we are and, and where we're going. It'll be a great way to set the tone. We have a number of sessions uh, called virtual clubhouse chats where fans will be able to interact with our players. Um, you mentioned going across all kinds of different uh, of our social platforms. We're going to be doing Twitter takeovers, specials on Instagram. If you've got a favorite platform, Mariner's YouTube channel, there's going to be something there for you. There's a complete schedule of all the events at mariners.com slash baseball bash. Um, <laughs> and everything is there. You can find out uh, what your favorite player is doing and how you can interact with them. And again, we're, we're really excited about the opportunity um, to give fans access to the entire organization. It's hard to believe, Kevin, we are just weeks away from pitchers and catchers in Peoria, uh, 72 days away from opening day here at T-Mobile Park when the Giants come to town. It, it will be great to have baseball back on the field, especially after a truncated season last year, there's no doubt. Yeah, no question about it. And the energy and optimism around this team and, and organization, we saw some of it come mm -hmm. to life last year with the, the sparkling gold golf play of JP and Evan uh, in the infield. And of course, the, the Rookie of the Year um, honors going to Kyle Lewis. I mean, there's, there's just such a blend of uh, talent uh, on both sides of the ball, pitching and uh, at the position players. Um, and yeah, we just, we just wanna get back down to Peoria and uh, hear the crack of the bat and the pop of the glove again. Will you or will you not be taking part in virtual bingo on Thursday? <laughs> yeah, I cannot wait to hear Rick Riz. Oh, call, Rick's doing it? Oh, yes. <laughs> to hear Rick Riz call bingo, it's just going to be uh, outstanding. There's so many fun things uh, planned for fans. There's, there's super trivia with Gary Hill, too. That, my friend, is going to be must-see. I've heard Gary told me that he was doing this. And are you, do you know that he will or will not be making the questions and answers up? Do, I mean, <laughs> will somebody pro be, be providing this to Gary? Gary doesn't know this yet, but he needs to write all of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. <laughs> oh, Kevin, uh, fantastic work getting all this put together. We're just getting this underway, and we're all excited to where it's going to go. Yeah. Well, thanks for your participation. And, again, we're, the, the fans are going to make this – Baseball Bash, a true party. Looking forward to their participation. And uh, we're, we're really excited to, 
to, to try something new and uh, to connect with our fans in new ways. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Uh, our thanks to Kevin Martinez for marketing and communications for stopping by. And, you know, he talked about all the different social media platforms that you can join and be a part of with the Mariners. And right now for a look as to what's coming up on the virtual community tour presented by Root, Root Sports, and our other virtual clubhouse chats, we'll take a look at the upcoming schedule. The Mariners Care Community Tour presented by Root Sports is going virtual in 2021. While we wish we could hit the road to be with you in person, instead we are coming to the safety of your home this week with a pair of live Q&As that you can stream on the Mariners YouTube channel. The tour gets rolling tonight as Mariners broadcaster Rick Riz, outfielder Braden Bishop, and infielder Ty France pay a virtual visit to our fans in Northwest Washington and British Columbia at 5 p.m. Then on Friday, Rick will be joined by starting pitcher Justin Dunn and Portland native Keenan Middleton as they join Mariners fans in Southwest Washington and Oregon. Visit Mariners.com slash community tour and learn more about the entire virtual community tour presented by Root Sports. The Mariners are also hosting other interactive Q&A opportunities through virtual clubhouse chats. First, we invite you to join Dave Sims and a pair of Mariners lefties, Justice Sheffield and Nick Margavishus, as they hold a Q&A session on YouTube this afternoon at 1 p.m. Then on Thursday at 1, tune in as Gary Hill chats with Mariners Director of Player Development, Andy McKay, about his collection of motivational books. Visit Mariners.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Twitch to tune into all of our virtual clubhouse chats. A lot of great stuff coming up ahead. And one of the really unique things that will bring your way over the next couple of weeks, we have our first ever all-Spanish media session. We'll be checking in with some of the top Latin players on the Mariners in 2021, guys like catcher Luis Torrens, utility man Jose Marmaleos, and one of the very top prospects in all of baseball, you know, the Mariners' top prospect, young Julio Rodriguez. That's been a pretty big offseason for Julio Rodriguez, hasn't it? He's been named a top 10 prospect in all of baseball. He was just recently featured on the cover of Baseball America, the January issue. On top of that, he's the cover boy for the 2021 Baseball America Prospect Handbook, which is an awfully big honor. On top of all that, if you didn't catch it earlier this offseason, he got his own TV show, Vibin' with J-Rod. Let's take a look at one of the latest segments. Okay. Yo tengo un par de preguntas y yo tengo aquí esta foto tuya y mía aquí. Yo tengo una tuya, una mía. Ahí está, ahí está, ahí está la, la foto. Mira la foto. Okay. Entonces, lo que nosotros vamos a hacer, yo voy a hacer la pregunta, vamos a votar a tres. Por ejemplo, si tú crees que tú haces eso mejor que yo, mm. tú pones la foto tuya. Okay. Y si tú crees que yo hago eso mejor que tú, tú pones la foto mía. A ver, es que yo, y bueno, pues si yo creo que tú haces una cosa mejor, dame ahí, vamos a ver. Dale. Okay. Dale. Ah, no va a tener la mía siempre, pues echemos no, 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 oye, ahora, oye, ahora, pero tú eres rastrero. Déjame ver. Ok. La primera pregunta va a ser: ¿quién cocina mejor? ¿Tú o yo? Tú. That's definitely me. I'm, I'm a better cook. That's, that's 100%. Ahora, ¿quién baila mejor, tú o yo? Pero yo, Pablo. Sí, sí, él, él, él como que la tiene ahí, pero... Él, he, 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 he can dance, he can dance. Like, I can dance too, but he, he, he is good at it. He is good at it. I'm also good, like, I can dance. Like, I'm good, but he, I will give it to him. I know how to, I, I know how to make food. Yo sé cómo, yo sé, tú, tú baila, yo cocino. Ah, pero espérate, espérate. Yo voy a ver si es verdad, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if it's true. Like, yo voy a ver. No, 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 no. Tú tienes que te voy a poner una musiquita para no, si pero si tú, me, si tú me vas, tú me tienes que poner un merenguito. Un merengue, ok, un merengue, vamos a ver. No, te voy a poner una bachata autonizando, te voy a poner. No, una bachata no, un merengue. Déjame ver, ¿un merengue de qué? Un merengue, un merengue, no es malo. Merengue, merengue, merengue. Vamos a poner un merengue ahora. I'm gonna play music for me, so we can dance. Merengue. Merengue de aquí, ya no, ¿tú qué? No, eso no es nada. No, esa, esa, esa es muy rápida, esa es muy rápida. Oh, my goodness. Eso, así, yo no me motivo, ¿verdad? Eso porque tiene que ser con una mujer. <laughs> en verdad, tiene razón, tiene razón, tiene razón, tiene razón ahí. Oh, funny stuff there. You can never have quite enough Julio. We're just a couple of months away from the start of the regular season, so it seems like a good time to check in with one of our favorite guys in the ballpark. It is Mariners Assistant General Manager, 
and VP of Baseball Operations, Justin Holler. Justin, it's good to see you, man. How are you? Thanks for having me. A lot of pressure. Favorite guys. It's well, I mean, group. one of it, it changes. <laughs> it can change at any moment. Depending actually. on who's sitting in yeah. the seat. <laughs> uh, man, I haven't seen you in a long time. How, what's this offseason been like for you? It's been good. Uh, I know offseason is kind of a misnomer, but for us, we do get to see our families every day, roughly, <laughs> instead of just every other week or so. Uh, so, no, it's been great spending a lot of time at home, uh, getting to reintroduce myself to the kids, and also like trying to make the team better work on the roster, um, work on minor league scenarios, depending on whether we have a minor league season or not next year, and try and make sure that the, the future of the Mariners is as bright as it can be. Hey, we saw last year in 2020 kind of the first wave of talent hit the major leagues for the Mariners. We saw some guys in the rotation, Justin Dunn, Justice Sheffield. We saw a goal Glover at first base and Evan White. J.P. Crawford we'd already seen part of, but we saw him kind of more solidify, especially with some hardware of his own, another gold glove uh, for the Mariners. Uh, when you start thinking into 2021 and possibly, not possibly, most definitely, a next wave, what are some of the things that excite you the most? Oh, I think that the first two names that come to mind are definitely Logan Gilbert and Jared Kelnick. Um, not sure when their arrival day will be. Uh, that's really up to them. But two guys with, with real star potential that I think are going to be here for a long time and really make an impact. Uh, and that's really exciting for us is the the next wave and the wave after that with guys like Julio Rodriguez and uh, you just had on the air and, and George Kirby and Emerson Hancock. Like there is a real defined next wave of players and then a real defined wave after that that's coming that we think are all impact players for this franchise. It's really exciting. So now that you and Jerry and the rest of the front office and the coaching staff have had a chance to kind of reflect back on uh, the alternate site last year in Tacoma and trying to patch this together to get innings, to get plate appearances for a lot of the young guys uh, that we'll see coming up in 2021. And then you were able to work out a situation in Arizona to have kind of a hybrid Arizona Fall League high performance camp. So when you look at those two things collectively and you forecast it into 2021, uh, what were some of the benefits that came from uh, both Tacoma and Arizona? I think you just learn more. You learn more about the people. You learn more about their skill sets and where they need to get better. Um, something is better than nothing. And uh, I think it was a huge emotional grind for those guys. Um, keeping in mind for Jerry and I, we were at home. Um, so we drive down to Tacoma. We watch them play. We go home. They were in Tacoma away from their families, uh, not playing real competition, just roughly playing scrimmages every day. Um, it was a huge grind. But the at-bats that, that guys like Kelnick and uh, Noel de Marte, um, Jake Fraley, some of the other guys that were there got, a uh, huge benefit to them. Uh, and then guys like Logan Gilbert getting to throw, I know, 30, 40 innings. Uh, it's not a lot, uh, but Logan got a ton of time last year to work on pitch mix, to work on uh, pitch shaping. He really, really made improvements to his changeup last year, and I think that is a huge benefit uh, of the simulated game scenario is he can just go throw – seven or eight or ten in an inning and not worry about you know missing his spot or giving up a hit because it's for him the benefit is for him uh for the version of logan gilbert that we'll see out on the field behind us at t-mobile not really the version that we see at the alternate site in tacoma where there's no one keeping score you know it is interesting the regime for the mariners that are putting this master plan in place you jerry from the top down uh, guys like Annie McKay, farm director, overseeing the, the day in and day out for the minor leagues. You guys have been here long enough now that there are more pieces to the puzzle than there were a few years ago, and some of those pieces are already beginning to connect. When you look at a lot of the names that you've mentioned, right, whether it be the most recent first-round draft pick in Emerson Hancock to Logan Gilbert, Kelnick, Julio, uh, it seems like in terms of a makeup of a guy, uh, there's a very specific DNA of a makeup of a guy that you guys are looking for. Can you explain what, what that is? Um, obviously, there's different ways to show leadership, uh, to show growth mindset, uh, to show being a good teammate. All the different players that you named go about it a little, a little differently, but they all really care. They care about getting better. They care about making their teammates uh, better. They invest in the systems and programs uh, that we've asked them to that we think will help them succeed at the major league level. You know, Kelnick is fiery and competitive and, and a grinder. Julio is energetic and joyful and intelligent uh logan is thoughtful and uh works as hard as any pitcher i've ever been around on improving himself and pushing himself to the limit those are the qualities you put them all together they embody exactly what we want to be on that field every night uh if your best players are those things it just makes it so much easier for everybody else to wrap their head around it i think one of the exciting things right now for the mariners organization is there are all these names that you've gone over 
on the minor league side that we haven't seen yet at T-Mobile Park. And we also have a bunch of names that we haven't even talked about. I won't have time to cover all of them that we did see last year at T-Mobile Park at the major league level, that first wave. How, how do you, in your role, balance attention on what's happening at the major league level and the, the really key development as well going on in the minors? I mean, it all matters. They're all pieces of our future. So um, I think one guy that we haven't talked about, like Mitch Hanniger is going to play our right fielder this year. Um, a lot of people forgot how good Mitch Hanniger was, and that's, that's very exciting for us is that, you know, I can focus my attention on Mitch taking the step back onto the field while at the same time watching Julio's at-bats in the Dominican Winter League this year and seeing the, what the next wave of a Mariners superstar might look like. So um, you just one eye on one prize and one eye on another prize, I guess is the best way of saying it. Well, Justin, it's always great to catch up with you. Thanks for all the insights and, and all your hard work. We can't wait for the 2021 season to get started. I can't wait either. Thanks, Goldie. There's Justin Hollander, Mariners assistant general manager. And the Mariners, uh, during this offseason, they've added some to the bullpen. Keenan Middleton, a Pacific Northwest native. Rafael Montero, who we saw last year in the division with the Texas Rangers. Recently, Scott Service had a chance to catch us up to speed about some of the offseason additions for the Mariners. Yeah, we are. I'm really excited the, the addition of both those guys. Uh, certainly, Montero's had a really good season. Shortened season by everybody last year, but, you know, we like his stuff and, and what he brings to the mix. He's got a little experience as well, so uh, that's a great fit. And I have history with Keenan Middleton. Uh, I was with the Angels when we first drafted him. So you know, knowing him a little bit and, and how he's wired, I think it's a really good opportunity uh, for people to come in, join our bullpen, and take on significant roles if they throw the ball well. Hey, speaking of the skipper, how about this for an opportunity for Mariners fans? We're going to have a chance for you to sit down for a virtual Q&A with the Mariners skipper, and it's aptly named Coffee Service, as you have a chance to interact with Mariners skipper Scott Service. Let's take a look at that opportunity. This Friday at 10 a.m., fans from near and far are invited to join a one-of-a-kind virtual event. Grab your morning cup of joe, whether you prefer it hot or iced, and sit in on Coffee Service, a special interactive Q&A session with Aaron Goldsmith and the man at the helm of the Mariners himself, Manager Scott Service. Fans can join this unique event by logging on to Mariners.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Twitch. This is one you won't want to miss. Well, that looks like fun, a little virtual Q&A with Mariner skipper Scott Service. Later on tonight, we'll be hearing the next episode of the Mariners Hot Stove Report, and that'll help kick off this Mariners virtual baseball bash. And we welcome to the program Gary Hill, Mariners broadcaster, Mariners producer and engineer on the radio side as well, and a major part of the Hot Stove Report. G-Man, how you doing? It's good to see you. Happy New Year. Hey, Happy New Year to you. It's great to see you in person. I feel like I talk to you every day. It but does feel that way, doesn't it? I have not seen you in person in some time, yeah, so this it, is great. It's been a long time. You've shaved, which is a nice, nice to see. Yeah, first time in a while. <laughs> <laughs> For the big show. Uh, hey, you are uh, Mr. Hot Stove Report. Your fingerprints are all over this every single week. Uh, tell us, there's some people uh, watching right now that maybe aren't familiar with the Hot Stove Report. Tell us all about it. Hot Stove is a fun show. It's on 7 to 9 p.m. every Tuesday night on our flagship station, 710 ESPN Seattle. It's a really fun opportunity to just talk baseball, talk Mariners. And like last week, we had Marco Gonzalez on. And the conversations we get into are really interesting because we talk to these guys during the season, right? But it, it's a whole different dynamic when we talk to them in the offseason. And they get some questions they've never gotten before. They, we get some insights we've never heard before. Like last week, Marco going in-depth talking about what exactly he does before his start. And it's really interesting to hear his whole routine and what he thinks about and, and what he's thinking about and what he's doing and that sort of thing. And we talked to everyone involved with the Mariners, players and coaches and everyone on down, Jerry DePoto and everyone else. It's, it's a really fun show, and we do it every Tuesday. See, now, the, the best part about the Hot Stove Report is we get to see uh, how popular or unpopular Gary is with the players <laughs> and, and how many times Gary gets completely ghosted by a guy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that only happens like a couple times a week, right, Gary? Well, it, it only happened once ever coming into this year. I don't know what I did. <laughs> Gary, Gary. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Gary, it's happened a few times this year. Gary right? called me <laughs> and was <laughs> genuinely concerned that there was a problem with his cell phone <laughs> because guys weren't getting back to him. And I said, Gary, I, hey, man, I'm just going to shoot you straight. I, 
I don't think it's a carrier issue. Huh. I think this is a Gary it's issue. A me, it's a yeah. me issue. Yeah. Why don't you let me start handling, reaching out? Just give me the master list of contacts, and I'll I'll take this on for you. You just you just take this week off. It, and it's gone great since then. <laughs> it's funny, like we're FaceTiming guys, yeah, we're it's calling great. right away. Oh, players everywhere. Yeah, we've got eight guys booked on a show. <laughs> you know, it's it's incredible. Just just changing personnel. It's amazing. Just the flip of a switch, That's just it. a slight pivot, and things just become sunnier, you know? Uh, but Gary, you do an awesome job. Uh, all jokes aside, uh, getting that show booked for us each and every week, a two hour show, seven to nine, each Tuesday on seven ten ESPN. And it gets us even more excited, I think, for the upcoming season when you get to talk to these guys, hear what their off-seasons are like, what they're looking forward to, what their expectations are for the upcoming season. Uh, last week, we, we talked to Kyle Glazer, mm. a senior writer, national writer for Baseball America. And in so many words, Kyle said, hey, it's the real deal. Like yeah. what the Mariners have cooking right now, uh, the young town and the majors and in the minors as well, this is elite level prospects that the Mariners have. And to hear from kind of a third party, an outside source like that to really validate it was special. Absolutely. And the show gives us a chance to really go in depth. You know, it's hard during the season with a, a pregame show, for example. There is so much going on with the game. Sure. It's hard to really go in depth 10, 15 minutes with somebody. And Kyle was phenomenal talking about the Mariners and the system and not only the depth, but also just the top tier. And it's a lot of the guys that we talk about all the time. It's the Kellnicks of the world and the Julio Rodriguez of the world. And he was very complimentary on what the Mariners mm -hmm. have going right now. Something else that uh, Gary does in his free time when he's uh, waiting for people to call him back, uh, he hosts <laughs> and produces uh, the Mariners' fantastic podcast, Mariners Pod, and people can hear the Hot Stove Report mm -hmm. on the podcast. Yeah, Hot Stove Report, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of other interviews along the way. Uh, we are approaching episode 700. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> 700? 700. We are, by the way, we are pretty sure that at one point Gary went from like 199 to like 300. Like, yeah. you just bypassed a whole hundred. But even if you did that, then you're at 600. Yeah, a lot of times I do this at, like, 2 a.m. So there's a chance when I was typing that I just kind of skipped 100. This so, is yeah. A, this is an actual thing. I listened to the podcast one time when I was driving to the ballpark, and the audio quality was not great. <laughs> like, it was— It wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible, but Gary is an audio quality fiend, which is one of the many things I love about him. He's very particular about it. And audio quality was pretty muffled. There was some background noise. <laughs> <coughs> and I called him and I said, Gary, what was going on with the audio quality, man? And he had, he had put his digital recorder between his legs <laughs> while driving because <laughs> his day was so slammed. And he was recording the entire podcast with the recorder, like between his knees, driving around wherever, Seattle. And that would explain why it sounded, you know, not so great. Which I don't think is against any sort of driving. There, like, no, I'm if you got pulled over. I'm myself as I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a lot going that day. I had, to, I had to do a few things at once. So, but it, dedication. This is yeah, how you get to 700 right. podcasts on Mariner's Pod, which is on Twitter as well. Yeah. At it's Mariner's Pod. At Mariner's Pod. How about With that? With a brand new logo. Brand new logo. The branding. It's, it's top notch. Uh, so, uh, point being, if you follow the podcast on Twitter, at Mariner's Pod, mm -hmm. you'll be alerted every time a new episode comes out. So, you would have like 700 alerts over the course. <laughs> Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> the or 600. Few, yeah. We, there's no way to know. There's no way to know. Uh Oh, I thought I heard your phone ringing, but that's definitely not happening. Uh, no. Garrett, hey, man, it's been uh, it's great to see you in person once again. I'll probably see you in person like in Peoria in a few weeks yeah. from now, um, God willing. So, um, yeah, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, th our thanks, to, in all seriousness, to Gary Hill. Does uh, magnificent work. He's the best at what he does on Mariners Radio, both on the year and off. Well, right now, let's take a look at the entire week ahead. <sighs> The first week of the Mariners Virtual Baseball Bash is just getting started. Be sure to log on to Mariners.com slash Baseball Bash to stay in the loop on the latest and greatest in the week ahead. Be sure to follow the Mariners on social media and become a subscriber to Mariners Mail for updates and tune in information as we get you ready for the 2021 season. Well, that does it for today's program. We're so glad you could join us. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next, we've got our media session with General Manager Jerry Depoto. I'm Aaron Goldsmith. We'll talk to you again next Monday.
Thank you for tuning in to this morning's program. Stay tuned as our week gets started with a media session with General Manager Jerry Depoto coming up shortly. Welcome to the Mariners Virtual Baseball Bash and this morning's media session. Good morning and welcome to the first day of the Mariners Virtual Baseball Bash and to the first of seven virtual news conferences. A special welcome to fans watching our media channels including Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch and Mariners.com. Fans on social media can ask questions via those channels Simply comment your questions in the chat of the live stream for a chance to have it answered. And to the media who've joined us, thank you also for being here today. A reminder, the call is going out live. Uh, and a reminder for questions, please utilize the raise hand feature. And please make sure that your name is correct so that when we call on you, we can identify you. We're going to start today with Fred Rivera. Uh, Fred oversees a number of departments here at the Mariners, including community relations. Fred will discuss community priorities for 2021, and provide an update on the club's social justice and racial equity commitments that were made last July. Before Fred speaks, we're going to share a short video about the club's Hometown Nine program, which provides baseball and softball scholarships and off-field support for nine eighth graders from marginalized communities. Action. My name is Dre Wild. I'm 12 years old and I'm from Tacoma, Washington. Most of my friends describe me as um, a very caring <laughs> person. My name is King Allah and I am 13 years old and I am from Seattle, Washington. I'm, I'm the comedian out of my uh, four siblings, you know, making them always laugh. My name is Darnell Carlisle. I'm 13 and I'm from Seattle. I like to play sports and hang out with my friends from time to time. My name is Michelle uh, Armira. I'm from Seattle and I'm 13. I like to hang out with my friends. My name is Tyson Martin. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I'm 13 years old. I like baseball, shoes. I'm Kahea Sharp. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Federal, Washington. I'm the youngest out of four. I'm Hawaiian, I don't know. <laughs> My name is Tamar Green. I'm 15 years old and I'm from Fort Pierce, Florida. When I listen to music, I like to you know, sing after the words. Hi, I'm Gabe Lopez. I'm from Mercer Island, Washington. I like to play video games and my favorite subject in school is science. Hi, my name is Noah Broussard and I'm from Renton, Washington. And I get along with everyone, and I seem to be able to just make friends easily, and a lot of them say that's what I am, just kind. I was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, so half a heart. I've had 22 procedures and four open heart surgeries. My cousins, they used to get bullied a lot, and I didn't really like that. So whenever I see a bully, I just try to talk to them. Making out on um, Fort Pierce, my, st my home, my city. Cause it's a lot of gun violence and fighting, hating, uh, yeah. It's my favorite sport, that's what I grew up on. The thrill of playing the game is not one that you can ever like feel in any other sport. I like playing pitcher because I like throwing hard. I play shortstop. I play catcher, shortstop, and third base. I hit a home run over the fence. <laughs> I don't know, I fell in love with the game. That's just why I like playing it and why I'm here now. 
because I have my friends there to cheer me on and my family to cheer me on. And get a base hit, it's really nice. And when you catch a ball, everyone's clapping for you, you know? Like, that's the joy about it. You can, everyone claps for you, even though you do, like, the smallest thing. It's just an awesome sport. What's up? <laughs> what up, my man? How you doing? Good, how are you? Man, I'm doing well, brother. Can't complain, man. Right. Just wanted to tell you, though, congratulations. You've been selected to be a part of the Hometown Nine. And we are really excited to have you. What's up, Gabe? How you doing? Oh, what's up? I'm such a What's up, brother? How you doing? I'm nice good. To you, man. I just want to uh, let you know, uh, congratulations. You are part of the hometown now. Oh. oh, my God. Thank you so much. Congratulations on being part of the hometown now. And anything that you need, we will try to get behind you and help you with that. Thank you. Oh, no, what's up, man? What's up, bro? What's up? We'd like to congratulate you on being accepted to the Hometown Nine program. Um, we're here to give back to you and mentor you and everybody else who's been accepted with you this year. Thank you. Congratulations, bro. Congratulations, brother. The purpose of me being here is to let you know you've been accepted to the Hometown Nine program. So congratulations <laughs> for that, Noah. Thank you. How's everything? How you doing? How about you? Doing pretty good. I'd like to congratulate you on making the home time nine for the Seattle Mariners. Continue to work hard. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> what's up, brother? Oh, what's up? How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Congratulations on being part of the hometown nine. Oh, thank you. We're excited to have you, man. We're excited <laughs> to have you. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh, there's not a word that can describe how much help you guys are gonna give. That's what I like about it. You're helping support somebody that needs help. That's what the Hometown Nine does for people. I'm part of the inaugural class. I'm part of the first class. The Hometown Nine. The first class of the Hometown Nine. And I'm a member of the Hometown Nine. The first class of Hometown Nine. The Hometown Nine. Hometown Nine. The Hometown Nine. Thank you. We're now joined by Executive Vice President Fred Rivera. Fred. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to talk this morning about the Seattle Mariners plans uh, for community relations in 2021. Uh, that video gets me every time. Um, when we talk about community relations, we start with our organizational mission, and that is to uh, win championships, create unforgettable experiences, and serve our communities. And we take very seriously our commitment to serve our communities, um, particularly with uh, an emphasis on youth baseball and softball and to solve our community's most pressing challenges. In uh, 2018, uh, some of you may recall that our organization committed to a program called Home Base, uh, we were the founding sponsor with United Way of King County and the King County Bar Association to create this program to help uh, stem the tide of homelessness that was uh, caused by evictions. Um, that program has been extremely successful and is just one example of how we really get into our community in a very deep and meaningful way uh, to, to, to try to solve some of our problems. Um, I'm proud to, to announce that the home base uh, program has now been expanded to be a rental assistance program in this COVID environment. It's now raised $30 million after the Mariners' $3 million seeding of that fund, and that program has helped uh, over 4,000 people avoid homelessness who are on the verge of eviction. Um, today, I want to talk with regard to 2021 about three areas. One is our plans uh, around youth baseball and softball. Second, update you on our commitments in the area of social justice and racial equity. And then third, talk about how we're going to engage with our community, particularly in this, uh, this virtual environment that we find ourselves in. Youth baseball and softball is within a program we launched in 2017 called On Base, base standing for baseball and softball everywhere. And we have a number of uh, programs under that umbrella that will continue in 2021. 
One is an equipment donation grant, an EDGE grant that we make to regional high schools who are in need of funding simply to buy bats and balls and equipment. Um, that's been a very successful program. We have some great stories out of that program, uh, including two years ago, a donation was made to uh, Garfield High School softball program right here in Seattle. Uh, that, uh, that team went on to win the state championship and became the first public high school to win a softball championship, uh, I, I believe ever, uh, or at least in the last several decades. We'll also continue with our clinics. Starting in late February, we'll have virtual clinics uh, involving players, alumni, and coaches. We'll do the best we can to uh, recreate the, the live experience in the, that virtual environment. We'll have other clinics throughout the year, including with, uh, with coaches, uh, coaches' clinics. We plan to continue our partnership with the Tacoma Parks and Metro Association, providing uh, administrative fees and uniforms, particularly for the, the T-ball age group. Uh, it's very important to us that as stewards of baseball and softball in our region, we try to get kids involved at the earliest age. And so uh, we really value that, that partnership with, uh, with Tacoma. We'll be sponsoring summer camps, uh, including offering scholarships for those who can't afford to, play, uh, to pay for uh, summer camps. Um, hopefully that will be uh, in-person summer camps starting in June and we'll continue our association with Challenger Little League for uh, kids with special needs to get them out on the field um, as well. Uh, second, on social justice and racial equity, you'll recall that in July we made four, uh, four commitments. Um, one was the Hometown Nine program, which we launched uh, this last fall, and I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. We also uh, committed to making a million dollars in community impact grants over a five-year period to organizations who are working on uh, racial equity and social justice. We'll be making our first announcement of a grant later this month, which is a, a grant to an organization that we expect to expand economic opportunity to our communities of color. We'll also be announcing the process we'll be using for grants later in the year and throughout the five-year period. Uh, second, we committed to a diverse business partner program in which we uh, would double our spend with businesses that are owned by persons of color, and we have launched that uh, program. We're starting to engage with the community, and we expect to announce the results of that program after uh, uh, later later in the year. Third, we created a diverse internship program to expand the diversity pipeline in professional sports in general, not just baseball, uh, particularly in, in areas that are particularly underrepresented including in media, uh, front office accounting, legal, and a number of other front office areas. And we'll start that program uh, this summer, including with a partnership with the City of Seattle's uh, Seattle Promise Program. The Seattle Promise uh, Program was instituted by, by the city a couple years ago. Uh, it pays for community college uh, tuition for kids who graduate from high school programs. And last is the Hometown Nine Program, which is really the cornerstone and also ties into our youth and softball uh, initiative. Um, the Hometown Nine program is aimed to, to serving underserved youth from communities of color. The goal is pretty simple. We want baseball and softball at all levels to be as inclusive as possible, and this aims uh, at the more elite select level. We, pay uh, we, we issue scholarships to nine uh, young men and women to participate in a, at an elite level. Um, we provide training, we provide grants for equipment, and then we also provide off-field support as well. Um, we have a number of front office uh, employees with the mm -hmm. Seattle Mar Mariners who are acting as mentors uh, for the Hometown Nine uh, Fellows. Uh, and we will keep these fellows in the program for five years, from their eighth grade year until they graduate. And each year we'll add nine more fellows to the mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. So we can create cohorts. And, and the goal of this program is not only to uh, offer this opportunity to the kids to play a high level of uh, baseball and softball, but also to create community leaders um, and also to be mentors to each other as this program continues to grow. We're very proud that T-Mobile was a founding sponsor of that uh, program with a donation of $50,000 for the first year. Lastly, I want to touch on how we plan to engage with our uh, community. Uh, this time last year and in prior years, we were doing what was known as the caravan, where we would go around the state uh, and try to try to engage with our our fans, our community, and start to create some 
some excitement around the season. In this virtual environment, we're gonna try to recreate that through a community tour um, where we'll have players, coaches, announcers uh, engage uh, in a virtual environment with our fans around, around the region. That starts actually this afternoon at five o'clock with an event that's focused on British Columbia and uh, Southwest Washington. Uh, Rick Riz will host it with uh, Braden Bishop and Ty France. Uh, it'll be a mix of question and answer um, uh, between Rick as well as the fans who will be able to particip participate mm -hmm. through the chat function. On Friday, we'll be in Oregon and Southwest Washington with Justin Dunn and Kenyon Middleton. Um, we're gonna continue the community tour concept throughout the year, um, both virtual and hopefully in person as we go forward. We're really committed to engaging with the community uh, on a 365 day basis. Um, we will be out at events around our region throughout the entire year uh, to really connect with our fans and those who uh, aren't yet fans, but we wanna make fans uh, uh, of the Seattle Mariners. So that's a summary of our, our program. Uh, welcome any questions that anyone has. I think we have a question from one of our social channels. Kelly? Fred, Andrew C. from Facebook asks, how many years will the Hometown 9 program be in place? Uh, hopefully forever. We have, uh, we have no sunset on that program. Uh, we'll, of course, monitor it every, every year um, to ensure that it's reaching its goals, but we have no intent right now to ever sunset that program. Anything else for Fred? All right, thank you very much, Fred. We'll be back in just a moment with Jerry Depoto. You'll see a short video while we reset the head table. Thank you. This is belted. How about that? Holy smokes, Kyle Lewis! Back, back, gone, home run! Holy smokes! Let's do J.P. Crawford throws, and that's a double play. Wow! What a play by Kyle Seeger. Justice Sheffield strikes out the side. Wow. Gonzalez, Bulldog, tough, you bet. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're joined now by Executive Vice President and General Manager of Baseball Operations, Jerry Depoto. Uh, Jerry will make an opening statement, then he'll take some questions. And just a reminder to all the media on the call that this is going out live, so please be aware of live mics. Jerry? Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you all for, for joining. This is, I, this is our first virtual kickoff, but in advance of a 2021 season that I think we're all looking forward to. Uh, obviously, th this is a year for us that, that we've been anticipating for some time as our young players have now started to arrive on our major league roster, uh, they have had some opportunity. Uh, guys like Kyle Lewis, Evan White, Justice Sheffield, uh, J.P. Crawford, so many others over these last you know two years, but particularly year and a half, have had an opportunity to, to cut their teeth at the major league level. We feel like this is another opportunity for a big step forward in, in, our, uh, in achieving our goals. And, building a young core that has a chance to, to compete consistently for championships uh, at the big league level. And we, don't, we feel like we've never been closer than, than we are today to, to that reality and, and excited for the, the start of 2021. And you know, it's, we're about a month out and hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, with uh, the public health and, and safety in mind, we are able to get there and, and uh, watch players play. It's, it'll be refreshing for all of us. 
with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you might have, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Question from Ryan Divish. Hey, Jerry, you just said you've never been closer. What are your expectations going into the season? I know last year was about getting experience for these players. You still have some guys you need to get experience, but what are realistic expectations for this team uh, going forward? I know you and Scott were very bullish at the end of the season, but where are you at with that? Uh, right where we were at the end of the season. You know, we feel like the, the next steps for this team are to continue to integrate the young players to this roster. We feel like there are another uh, handful who are not far off. Uh, we'll, we'll see once we get down to Peoria and, and as we progress into the season, but a uh, handful of, of our more polished or advanced prospects that will have an opportunity in 21. And first and foremost, it's to gain that experience, to, to continue to grow the base with the guys that I mentioned earlier, you know, Chef and Kyle and Evan and the like, and then introduce the, the next group uh, with the idea that if things break well for us and we get into midsummer and, and we stay close to this thing and and we do have an opportunity to sneak up on the back of the, the playoff field, that's that's a possibility for us and would be a goal. You know, it's young teams tend to to gel quicker than you you might think. We can't go in expecting that we're going to to run to the top of the American League West, but I think we can we can set the goal of competing for a, a playoff and we'll see how it goes. And, and if we take a step toward that in 2021, I think that would be a great achievement for, for our organization. A uh, question from Corey Brock. Hi, Jerry. Uh, you talked at the end of the year about upgrading the bullpen. You've gone to appears great lengths to add some arms at the back end there, especially a lot of arms that could miss bats. Are you, uh, you sort of speak in generalities about how much more, uh, comfortable or uh, excited you are about this group uh, moving forward into this season? But, uh, on paper and, and even emotionally, it's just, it's a better group. There's, there's more major league experience. There's more major league performance history uh, with this group than there was a year ago. So naturally the expectation is that we're in better shape than we were to start the 2020 season. And, you know, that we had set a pretty low bar, you know, the, our bullpen has really been an area of struggle over these past two years. And while we've been able to get a good look at some of our younger guys and give them opportunity, some have taken the opportunity and run with it. I, I guess most notably and Anthony Mashevitz uh, st stands out. But, you know, for, for every one of those opportunities, we've, we've fallen short in some other areas. So, we did focus on, on beefing up this play, space and, and heading into the offseason. And we feel like we've done that. You know, the, the trade that brought Rafael Montero in, bringing Kendall Graveman back uh, in free agency, going out and bringing in Keenan Middleton. The, the theme with all of those players is, is that we feel like either, A, we know a lot about them in, in the case of a Kendall Graveman or even in, in the case of Keenan Middleton. But also the, the, the idea that we are trying not only to focus on getting better in 21, but finding ways to continue to progress for 22 and beyond. And, you know, to, to that matter, you know, Keenan Middleton is, is now part of the, 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 the roster and comes with, you know, three years of remaining control, you know, through arbitration. Rafael Montero still has two years of, of club control uh, on his agreement. And we feel like we are starting to build uh, some stability into a bullpen that really hasn't been very stable over the last couple of years. And, and if we have the opportunity to add to that group between now and the start of the season, we, we will. And I can't say that that will be a primary focus between now and February 19th, but it remains part of our focus. You know, if we'd like to continue to add to our club and that's one area, but we feel like we've gone a long way toward, toward making that a, a more, reliable unit than maybe it has been the last two years. Larry Stone has a question. Hi, Jerry. Um, I was just wondering what you think of the relatively slow pace of free agency industry wide. And do you expect to continue to dip into the market beyond the bullpen uh, for other areas, starting pitching outfield or, or something else? Yeah. I guess I'll answer in reverse. We are active right now and, and have been throughout the offseason and trying to, to get better. Uh, and that was largely 
focused on our pitching, you know, adding Chris Flexen, like I talked about, Kendall Graveman, Rafael Montero, Keenan Milton. We don't feel like we've been quiet or slow. Uh, if, if that's what it, it seems to, to you all, uh, I apologize. It, I know it's not our normal rate of activity, but that is more where we are in our, our build, truly. So, you know, we, we've, we've added quite a bit to, to our team already. It has been a, a slow to develop off season market, particularly at the top of free agency, but that hasn't really been a, a focus for us. I, I think you have seen uh, over the course of, you know, particularly this last four or five weeks, that the market is moving and, and you're starting to see a lot of players that you recognize, recognizable names uh, coming off the board, especially in that bullpen. And, you know, those are generally areas where we've been connected. Uh, I don't think a reliever has signed yet that we didn't have some conversation with or, or about uh, either internally or with agents, et cetera. We have been fairly connected in trade discussions. Although trades, you know, it, it, they're, they ebb and flow. You, you could see a, a flurry and then see nothing at all. But we continue to be connected to free agents we think can make us better. Uh, and specifically, we, we would like to add uh, a little bit more depth to that bullpen if it's possible. Uh, we are open to adding another starting pitcher and, and increasing our depth in the rotation, again, if that's possible. And we would like to add a left-handed bat to our mix. And, and whether that is a, a versatile player who has multi-position ability or it, it's in the outfield or at second base, those are alternatives for us. Uh, right now, those are the least uh, secure positions we have with a returning player or veteran. And you know we have the benefit of the versatility of a player like a Dylan Moore or Ty France or Sam Haggerty that allow us to to be able to address needs based on the best fit for the team and then adjust as we go. Tim Booth. Hey, Jerry. Do you have a feel yet for how much, from a developmental standpoint, the timeline of some of your top prospects might have been stunted by not having a true minor league season this year? Or is that something that will sort of play out through spring training and into the first part of the season? I think it'll be the latter part of that, Tim. You know, we truly don't know. And and, and that makes us one of 30 teams that, that truly don't understand the the effects of the, the shortened season on young player development. You know, we the, no minor league season was a setback. There's no question about that. So, you know, what we and, – and frankly, we weren't able to replicate that volume either at the alternate site or what we were doing down in the, the Florida player development programs uh, and Arizona Instructional League. So, you know, we, we have to be aware that there could be uh, a delay in the way some of those players come through. But I don't go into it, especially with the elite-level prospects, thinking that that's going to be uh, a long delay. As I said, with the major league club, you know, you tend to see big jumps uh, with young players once they get comfortable at, at a level. And uh, with the, the young prospects of, of elite talent, that it's the same way. You know, you could see guys like a Julio Rodriguez or a Jared Kelnick or a Logan Gilbert. They will not, uh, they will not miss it as much as some others who might have needed that step by step. So uh, we're. We're going to be open-minded to, to using 2021 as an opportunity to, to move some of those guys a little quicker if, if that's what it uh, appears is good for their development. And if they need more time, we're going, to be, we're going to be receptive to that as well. We're not in a rush. You know, we are here. To, we're playing the long game with our roster. We, we believe this is an opportunity to open a window and keep a window open for the foreseeable future. We've built a lot of prospect cachet. We've, we've acquired and developed a number of young players for our roster, and we still have a long way to go for that roster to be fully developed and ready to, to compete consistently at a championship level. And we can't rush those young players because we'll do more harm than good in, in so doing. So you know, we'll, we'll take it case by case. And, and my guess is that the more advanced of those prospects will progress quicker and the guys that were at the lower levels of the minor leagues and needed more time are going to require more time. And that's just something we're going to have to adapt to. Uh, Danny O'Neill has a question. 
this this might be tied to Tim's question, Jerry, but um, could could you see in the next wave of prospects? You kind of mentioned that first group of Justice Sheffield and and Justin Dunn, Kyle Lewis getting here. Who who are the guys that you see in the the next wave that could be soonest to get to Seattle? Uh, you know, the the obvious for us are Logan Gilbert, who, who I think among our group is is the closest to uh, to major league preparedness. He's uh, just where he is emotionally, what he does physically. He was he was outstanding at the alt site during the summer last year. Uh, we do have to be conscious of where his innings are, and you know, it, it, my preference would be with all young players is just to give them the opportunity to onboard at the appropriate mm-hmm. pace. But Logan stands out, uh, as does Jared Kelnick, Cal Raleigh, uh, potentially Taylor Trammell, uh, who we are still learning a lot about. But, you know, he's another of those that we haven't yet seen at the major league level. Uh, those four stand out as the next, you know, uh, notable wave that's coming. And then there's another group behind them that we think is, is not terribly far off. You know, but to Tim's point earlier, we do need to be aware that, that the, the development may take some time. But I suspect the first three of those names I mentioned, and, and then Taylor, we will learn as we go. Uh, we expect that those guys will have every opportunity to make their major league debuts at some point in 21 and, and then start, you know, put them in position to get the reps just as we did with the group that came before. And uh, they're super talented players, and, and my guess is they'll hit the ground running when given the opportunity. A uh, question from our social channel, Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, Jerry, uh, Kai from Facebook asks, which under the radar prospect do you think we will know the name of this time next year? Well, there's a bunch. You know, we, we like every other team, we love our players. It's, uh, and we have, we have so many fun young players in our system to like. I guess the, from an under the radar perspective, the most under the radar would be Levi Stout jumps out at me. Uh, Levi was a third round draft for us in 2019 and immediately had Tommy John surgery, has now recovered and, you know, really was outstanding down in, in Arizona Instructional League, uh, jumped out. Stuff was in the mid 90s with two polished breaking balls and, and a good field of pitch. Uh, he really stands out as, as one of those guys on a more uh, 40 man close to the major leagues type of scenario. I think Juan Ben is, is a guy who really uh, has made a ton of progress. And Juan is one of those guys who, you know, while he was at the alt site last year, as well as Arizona Instructional League, he is just 21 years old this year. And, and you know, there's so much to, to it, development in front of him. And of all of our 40 man players, he's the guy who has the chance to make the biggest step forward in 21, who already took perhaps the biggest step forward in 20. And, uh, but now that he's on the 40-man roster and the clock is ticking with options, you know, we, we, we would anticipate uh, a pretty quick ascent for Juan. I don't anticipate that being in 21, but I think this time next year you will be really uh, quite surprised by the physicality of his stuff and how quickly he could come. Those are two that really jump out at me as guys that aren't generally discussed in the mainstream that have a chance to really make a huge difference or or jump uh, in 21. And from a position player perspective, I'd say that guy's probably Tyler DeLoach. Uh, He is is probably one of the the more under-the-radar, quiet, really strong uh, – and I I apologize, Zach, but – we had Scott and I have have an issue with that, but you know Deloach, our second round pick from last year, is is uh, really polished, multi skilled, does everything well. There is no one gaudy skill.
position. Well, the the limitations on innings in 2020 is part of what our calculus was in going with a six man rotation. And you know, we we on multiple levels, the six man rotation in 2020 we thought was a better way to preserve health and and, and really further development. And it's you know, this is a nuance that's not going to be captured in kind of a saber analysis of what we're doing uh, from a performance standpoint with a six man rotation. But the six-man rotation allows for two bullpen days. You know, it allows for two work days in between. And, and when your starting pitchers are all generally aged 24 to 26 and have less than a year's experience, those work days are really important. And, you know, it, it allows for pitch development and pitch shaping. It allows for training on delivery refinement and command. And it's not just about getting out every fifth day and performing. Uh, and it's, it's very much still a development program. So we feel like that's a huge advantage with the six man uh, with such a young staff. And, you know, it, and it is still a young staff uh, and that's an important element here. So with, with that and understanding that the, the most, the, the highest volume starters in 2020 were guys that threw 60 to 80 innings. And, and, you know, that's a, that's not a, a, a high volume of innings in the grand scheme of things. And we feel like the jump from 60 to 80 to, say, 140, 150 is reasonable. For the guys who might have been at the top end of that scale, to get them into a 160, 170 type of range is, is reasonable. Going beyond that is not likely. And, and we feel like this allows us to help govern that and – you know, it's we are going to start the season. I think that you can press very hard on the pen, uh, if not, you know, secure if they're healthy. Marco and Chef and Kikuchi for certain will be taking their turns. Others will be given an opportunity to compete for those spots. We did sign Chris Flexen, and he will be one of our six starters. Uh, that allows for two open spots that are generally going to be competitions uh, and. It's going to be some combination of Justin Dunn and Nick Margavichis and Logan Gilbert and perhaps others who aren't necessarily currently in the Mariners uh, system. And, and it could extend to players like an LJ Newsom or minor league free agents that will be given further opportunity. But we feel like there's still something to go add in that space. Uh, we won't go in short. You know, we, we feel confident in the group that we have today. And we were very excited by some of the development with guys like like Marge and like LJ Newsom and and what we saw, though it was sometimes turbulent, the 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 fact that Justin Dunn got through his first season and learned a lot. We, it's we are all going to be better for the experiences that these guys had in 2020, but we won't overload them with innings, and we do want to make sure that we still have those work days in between because it is largely a young group. Shannon Dreyer. And Jerry, you just answered my pitching question there, so I'll take it over to the other side. When you look at your young hitters, they got 200 to 250 at bats last season. Uh, what do you hope to know about them at about 550 to 600, which will be getting you close to that trade deadline? What do you need to know that it's going to help you make the next moves? I think this is where you see players start to stabilize. You know, there's there's a lot of turbulence in that first three to 500 at bats of a major league career. And then, you know, more often than not, you're going to see guys find their, their water level during that time. And, and a lot of our players are getting into that space. Some have now graduated beyond it. And there's always going to be, you know, a player who matures a little bit later. There's always going to be the, the guy who exceeds expectations a little bit sooner. But this, the first half of 2021 is going to be a great time for us to learn about the players who are in that uh, that three to five hundred zone, like guys like Ty France and Evan White and Kyle Lewis, and you know, it, there's some of the young guys that haven't yet made their debuts. But it, this is this is still very much uh, you know the the assess and evaluate part of the the exercise with the young players, and and there's you're going to see some ebb and flow. That's what it's like to be a young player making your way in baseball and. And the, you know, the two for 20, that's going to happen to every player in the league at some point. When it happens to a young player, once they're able to slow that down and recognize that it's the same as any other, you know, mini slump they've ever been through, they come out of it quicker, they get back to their skill set, and they do their thing. And, 
And for whatever reason, it's usually about that two-thirds of a season uh, of major league experience when guys really start to breathe. So July, August of that first year, and what we're now understanding with, with the, the truncated 2020 season is it's more the volume. If, if we can get these guys to you know, that 450, 600 range, that's when you really start to see the, the player uh, settle into who they're going to be. And, and we're pretty confident that we learned a lot about this group last year, and we'll learn even more in the first two or three months of this year. Uh, Ryan Divish. A 60 game season without fans affected teams financially. Did did the COVID season and, and not having fans and everything else uh, change what you wanted to do this off season from a, a, a acquisition standpoint? Did your payroll budget change? Did any of that change uh, what you planned to do maybe going in this off season? Whereas a full year might have been different. Uh, economically, no. Frankly, you know we are. Our program was set up to to develop these young players, so it's the where there is a I guess a little bit of ambiguity is that if we would have had the full season in 2020 to give all of our offensive players those four or five six hundred plate appearances, if we would have been able to achieve 100 150 innings for those starters or or the type of exposure that that would be needed to evaluate those relievers. You know that may have given us greater clarity on where our primary needs were for 22 and beyond. So, to the extent that that affects the way we go out and spend our future payroll dollars, it certainly does. Uh, we still need to find out about our young players and where we need the help. You know, we can spin around the field, and from you know what we talked about earlier with multi-position. Uh, diverse, flexible, athletic players like Dylan Moore or Haggerty or France uh, on down to young players who are still evolving as everyday players in the big leagues like Evan and Kyle and, and the returns of Mitch Haniger and Tom Murphy and, and the evolution of J.P. Crawford. At every position on the field, we feel like we have the, the current and future best solution for the Mariners. Now we have to find out the, how they progress. And and we weren't in a position headed into 21 where we felt confident that we'd seen enough in, in making that evaluation. Therefore, we weren't going to go add to our roster beyond 21 in ways that was going to limit the, the exposure for those young players. So it, it's, it's a little bit of a nuance, but there's, it had nothing to do for us. It had nothing to do with the, the revenues or, or economic uh, issues that clubs may have experienced in 2020. It had everything to do with the model we were creating. And, and 60 games just didn't give us enough time to answer a lot of the questions we needed to answer. And we don't want to go out and falsely fill spots that we probably or, or could perhaps have the, the, the answer already here. We just need to give them playing time. Tim Booth. Jerry, excuse me, Jerry, you mentioned Mitch there. I'm wondering if you can give an update on where he's at with his recovery and what's reasonable expectations for him. And then along with that, um, updates on Shed and, and Andreas Munoz and his and their recoveries from their injuries. Sure. Uh, Mitch looks great. For those of, of you who follow Mitch uh, on social media, you know, the, the, the posts he's made, uh, he looks terrific physically. Uh, our assistant hitting coach, Jarrett DeHart, went and visited Mitch live and, and spent a little bit of time with him and, and came away uh, gushing. Uh, it, it, how, how good he looks physically is the, the, the takeaway. As all of you know, this has been a tough uh -huh. year and a half for Mitch, you know, not playing, uh, the emotion that goes with not playing. But more importantly, none of us, myself, maybe most especially, really understood the, the significance of the two injuries that he was trying to recover from and rehabilitate at the same time. Uh, and, you know, what he looks like today as opposed to what he looked like this time last year is entirely different. He looks strong. He looks physical. He's going through full baseball activity uh, in, in a high-speed way that he just wasn't able to do at any point over the last year and a half. So... We're really excited about seeing Mitch come in, and, and it's it's the easy 
the identification is when Mitch Hanniger's healthy, he's our best player. He's Mitch. Mm-hmm. Mitch is a multi-skilled, well-rounded, diverse player who, when we've seen him at the top of his game, is is really one of the more complete players in the American League. And and uh, if we can get some version of of that Mitch Hanniger back on the field, it really changes our our arc, you know. And 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 we know that he's he's going to play his 30 year old season this year. Nobody is more attentive to the way they keep and, and take care of their body than Mitch, and and we feel like he still has his best years as a player in front of him. And we're going to find out how close that is to reality when we get down to Peoria next month. Uh, as far as Shed goes, JD also visited with Shed. Uh, looks great, you know, swinging the bat, doing all of the the baseball activity. Uh, has recovered very quickly and. You know that's a that's a positive sign. Shad will come into spring training and compete, mm-hmm. whether for that open spot at second base with Dylan Moore, uh, or the the opportunity to get utility at bats. You know, we've given Shad some exposure, moving him out to the outfield and other spots. He's an athletic player, so we think he's going to come and 100 percent ready to play. Uh, and then Andres Munoz, Andres will not be ready for opening day. He is throwing off the mound, and and his progression has has been steady. He will be about a year uh, in his uh, recovery from Tommy John when we are down in, in Peoria. So right about the middle of March, he gets to that 12-month mark. And if we're being conservative, it's usually a 12- to 15-month uh, recovery from Tommy John. We would rather err on the side of caution. But Andres, is, he's been throwing free and easy for quite some time now. He feels great, and the, the PTs have been – very positive about where he is in his recovery. Uh, we have a question from Larry Stone. Yeah, Jerry, I was just wondering, as the season nears, if you have a better feel for whether spring training will start on time, it'll be a normal spring training, 162-game season. You expect expanded playoffs again, the pinch runner and extra innings, uh, seven-inning double, second game of double headers, that sort of thing. Do you have a feel for how the season's going to look? Uh, I do. Uh... I think we're going back. Well, my, my, the real answer to that question, as I understand it, we are going to play by the, what we would qualify as normal rules. So uh, 26 man roster, we are going to play, uh, hopefully we're going to play 162 game season with, with what would have been a normal postseason and roster scenario with expected rules uh, like we would have played with in 2019 rather than the adjust in ver- adjusted versions in, in 2020. That's the expectation. Uh, and be flexible and nimble to, to as we get closer to opening day, like was the case last year, if you know something uh, leads us in a different direction between now and the time we start to play, whether that is discussion uh, at the league level uh, or beyond, we will – We'll make any adjustments we have to, but we are going into the 21 season just like we would have uh, if this were uh, 2019 with the expectation that there'll be 10 postseason teams, 162 game schedule, a full spring training, normal travel, and no restrictions outside of the obvious need to have uh, health and safety protocols in place while we deal with the ongoing pandemic. Uh, question from Corey Brock. Jerry, in terms of Evan White, we saw a lot of good things with his uh, batted ball profile. Uh, certainly the 42% strikeout rate wasn't anything that he's uh, seen at all in the past. A young guy finding his way. Uh, what are the encouraging signs that you've seen from him moving forward to lead you to believe that he'll continue to develop as a hitter? No, I mean, you hit on some of them there, Corey. It's a, Evan hits the ball hard, and it's something we really stressed when he was coming from Arkansas to Seattle. Is, you know, he's an athletic player, does a lot of things well. He has generally had a strong batted ball profile. That carried over to his major league exposure experience. Uh, he hit the ball hard and, and, and did so among the players in the world who hit the ball the hardest. He stood out in that regard. So... You know, the, the issue with Evan in 2020 was nothing more to me, nothing more than the anxiety go, that goes with a young player starting from zero. And when he slumped early, he allowed it to start to, to, to roll on him. 
And he caught it. He had, he had a, a run from the middle of August to the middle of September where he was quite good. And we think the, the, the batted ball profile in addition to all of the trends that he's shown through his player development. Evan's not a guy that we think has a, a, a high strikeout probability. He is a guy who does and always has been willing to take his walk. Uh, and he swings at the right pitches and he hits them hard. And what we saw last year, I think, helped go a long way toward uh, reassuring us in our optimism of what his power profile might look like. You know, it, he he does have the ability to, to drive the ball in the gaps and, and the over-the-fence power exists as well. So, you know, we think if we can get Evan back on track in terms of his, his pitch selection was quite fine. He just... He had, there were a lot of misses in there that, that just haven't been part of Evan's normal uh, package or, or profile. And that, we, we feel like, is just an anomaly rather than a, the new norm for, for Evan White. We have a question off our social channels. Kelly? Jerry, Anthony L. from Facebook asks, how difficult is it going to be to uh, scout amateur players this year for the draft? difficult uh and, and it, it's funny i had a conversation about that this morning with scott hunter our our scouting director it's the the challenge exists right now like with major league spring training starting next month we are expecting the college seasons to start next month uh the junior college seasons start now uh they're, they're starting in january so you know we are preparing to get up and moving uh, our focus in the early going is going to be on what we consider to be the, the top tier of the high school talent pool and, and getting as much volume with those players as we can in the early days of, of their playing schedules because they're the players we've seen the least. Uh, part of the challenge that we have in 21 is that unlike in 20, you know, at least in 2020, we had the summer of 19 to, to fall back on and the fall uh, of the, the previous season. So that we did have some information to, to bring to the table with the college players in 2020. That's not necessarily the case as we head into 21. There, there, were no, uh, there, there was no Cape Cod League. The volume that the players saw in the summer and how frequently we were able to see them was very different than it has historically been. And, and as a result, we go into this year – treating those bigger conference colleges, you know, the, the ACC, the SEC, the PAC, th those are conferences that we are going to spend weekends just sitting on to, to make sure that, that we get a high volume with a lot of those players that will really fill in the gaps in the top 10 rounds of a draft and, and make sure that we get as much familiarity with players that we may have had, you know, 100, 150, 200 plate appearances with going into their normal draft season and this year we're probably dealing with less than 50 so uh, again just like with our young players we have to be patient uh, we have to understand that the system is not going to be perfect and and go make the best evaluations and, and selections we can but that's how we're planning on approaching it we have a question from lauren smith Hi, Jerry. Uh, now that jp cropper has been here for a couple years and kind of become a, a leader in your infield what do you see as the next steps for him uh, JP, the, to me, the forward progress that JP made, you know, in 2020 was extraordinary. And I, and I think the best thing uh, about what happened with JP, I, I could easily point to the gold glove, you know, but that's just a, a, a I guess, a public acknowledgement of excellence that we saw every day and not unwelcome. You know, it's great. And, and he'll be able to look at it for the rest of his career and hopefully have more. But the thing that excites me most about JP is that he doesn't come out of his approach. And, and that is the sign of, of developing maturity at the major league level. You know, he, he swings at the right pitches. He makes good swing decisions in the box. He, is, he does have uh, an, a mature approach. And, and we think a mature approach coupled with aesthetically a good swing. He has, it, JP's always had a good swing. We think there's more offensive ceiling uh, to him. But... You know, the way he stabilized our infield defensively and really as a captain on the field. Uh, and, and while he wasn't carrying gaudy offensive numbers, the consistency in his approach from beginning to end, I, I thought was a real standout. And, you know, we've always talked, you know, we with the Mariners have always talked about the, the, the reliance on process over result. 
JP's process in 2020 was outstanding. And, you know, the, the offensive results we feel like will eventually start catching up with his process. He's still a very young guy, just like it happened with his defense. Uh, and, you know, he's, uh, he's minimally he's here for, you know, another four years. And we're excited to, to have him as part of what we're doing. And as importantly, he really fits in our clubhouse. JP's got an easy way about him, a calm that he brings to his teammates, uh, and he plays the game you know, under control with, with, with athleticism and adjustability. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the way his season went for him last year because he developed mature programs that have the chance to give him you know, a stable foundation to build on as he grows forward. And a question from Daniel Kramer. Hey, Jerry, uh, I wanted to ask you about the catching situation. Scott talked about it a little bit in December, but, you know, Torrens had a really nice September and Murphy obviously had a, a big 2019. How will you kind of balance those guys' time as you enter camp here? I'm not sure that Scott would talk about the catching situation in advance of, of anything else, but there's just like that, you know, Murph, Murph is 2019. You couldn't be too much better than Murph was for us. And in the opportunities he had, he can catch, he controls the run game. He's got power. Uh, and it's off the charts. Makeup Murph is very much a key to our game day preparation. Uh, the way we manage and, and communicate with our pitchers. And like, like you said, there's a reason why we went out and acquired Luis Torrens. And, and we feel like the, if there is a player, and this might have gone to Kelly's question earlier about surprising names, it might be throwing a guy out there who has a year and a half of major league service uh, as, a, as an under-the-radar guy. The way we evaluate Luis Torrens is probably very different than the way the public may perceive Luis Torrens. Uh, we feel like he has every chance of being a, an above-average offensive player at his position. You haven't seen the best of what he does defensively yet. Uh, his pitch framing skills have been well regarded through the minor leagues as we see through our statistical lens or, or analytical lens. And, you know, our goal would be going into the season for the two of them to share the position, you know, some type of 50-50, 55-45 split, uh, giving both opportunity to play regularly. Uh, and there will come a time in the season, and, and, you know, I would imagine in 21, not too many teams go through – uh, with two catchers w without having some type of hiccup. It's a tough position to play. Uh, but we would anticipate, you know, providing some opportunity for Cal Raleigh somewhere in the season. Uh, whether that is late in the season or as a, as a call up at the end, we do feel like Cal is, is also a, a really bright part of our future. And it's exciting to talk about a, a, a catching depth in a positive way. And, and it's something we feel like we've done. Uh, a decent job in building with this group. And a question from Kieran O'Dwyer. Hi, Jerry. Uh, similar, to, you, you talked about the short season and the challenges I presented last year. Similar to your thoughts on Evan and JP, what were some of the other key encouraging signs and takeaways that came to light from last year that gives you uh, promise heading into the 20? 21 season and as it relates to the club's plan for 2021 and beyond? You know, for me, the far and away, the, the most positive development that we had was that we had a young group of energetic players come to the big leagues and create an, an energy driven environment that was, it was thoughtful. Uh, the group is prepared. They made adjustments as we go. Uh, we believed that, in planning for 2020, when we started this this version uh, of where we are as an organization following the 2018 season, uh, the and, and I will defer to whatever Ryan would like to call it today. But the you know we we will when we started building this roster, you know the the idea was to trend toward 2021, believing that we could compete uh, for an AL West championship and. You know, along the way, we had a pandemic, and we had to to at least assess where we were. But you know, the reality is that we saw a young group struggle for the first four weeks, five weeks of the 2020 season, and then find their groove. And, and you know, during the the second half of even the shortened season, I think over the last 30, 35 games, we had one of the best records in the American mm -hmm. League and, and the best record in the American League West. Uh, 
better than the Astros, better than the A's, uh, better than the Angels over the, the end of that season. While we don't necessarily believe that that portends that we are the best team in the division and ready to roll, that does show growth and maturity with a young group, that, that they were able to get through a collective struggle and find ways to go out and, and compete and, and, and win games. Uh, that was a positive development. Uh, the way we handled a really difficult year, whether it was the, the health and, and, I guess, the protocol-driven environment we were working in, our players were unbelievably responsible. And, you know, they went through what I think has to be the most difficult season that a major league player has ever had to prepare to, to deal with. They went through it, and they, they did it with no previous experience, not just in how to behave as big leaguers and how to carry themselves in, in that light, but to how to deal with, with this type of, of world environment and, and health environment that we're working in. I thought that was remarkable. And then coupled with it that we had you know, a, a club that was very well re represented, represented uh, with African-American players. I think the, you know, by far the, the highest percentage of African-American players on rosters in, in Major League Baseball. And in a time of, of social or civic unrest, I could not have been prouder of, of the way our young players responded and our leaders led. And that was, uh, those were the things that stood out to me most, was, was how we handled ourselves in real life situations, how we grew in the face of adversity on all levels, and the energy with which we did it. Because I think it has a chance to make this a special group when you couple it with what we think is an extremely talented group of young players. And I, I, I don't even know if that's debatable. They are extremely talented. It's just a matter of how quickly we grow and refine those talents. A uh, question from Keizo Kanishi. Yes. Uh, hi, Jerry. Uh, can you describe about uh, hiring uh, Kuma as a special assistant coach? And also, uh, how much do you expect his effect for those young starters, you know, lining up? Yeah, you know, Kuma, it's funny. We in Back in 2016, 2017, my first two years here with the Mariners, we, we, I was fortunate enough to, to work with Kuma. We had him uh, 2016 as, as perhaps our steadiest, not even perhaps, he was our steadiest starter and, and carried the water for a rotation that was often beat up and, and never really seemed to be fully healthy. Uh, and, and he did it at sometimes having to hold himself together from a, from a health perspective. And uh, I think one of the best quiet competitors that I've ever been around always prepared, incredibly respectful teammate and, and I guess friend uh, to the, to the others in the clubhouse. There's, he has a professionalism about him that, that jumps off the page. And in 2017, when, when we let Kuma know that we wouldn't be bringing him back as a player, I said to him, on the day when you decide that you want to start your next career, you know, whatever that is, if you want to work in front offices, if you want to work in scouting, if you want to work in, in connecting with players and in coaching, just call me. Uh, and lo and behold, the, this offseason he called me. And uh, he said, I'm ready for that. So, you know, I, I got a text from him. I want to say it was early October. Uh, I got a text from Kuma telling me that, that he was interested in starting the next stage in his career. And, and for those of you who know, Hisashi, he, was, he is unbelievably respectful of, of every step, didn't want to move too fast, didn't want to bite off more than he could chew, uh, but did want to, to step in and, and start to learn. And, and we think he can make an immediate difference. With such a young rotation, we think he can make a, an immediate difference in helping, uh, helping us communicate in a different way with Yusei and, and helping him grow. I know the two of them have some relationship. Uh, and I know that, that even as it pertains to developing our young starters, the, the George Kirby's and Emerson Hancock's and Logan Gilbert's and Brandon Williamson's at the minor league level, they will learn a lot from Hisashi. There is no language barrier when, when it's the professionalism that, that he carries. It, it jumps off the page. So uh, thrilled to have him as part of what we're doing. We will integrate him slowly so that he's not, you know, being pushed too fast or being overwhelmed, but feel like he has a chance to really make a difference uh, because of who he is. He, he's the type of person that we want to, to connect with our young players and, 
and help drive our future program. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. We'll start with Tim Booth. Jerry, you guys were pretty successful last season about not having COVID sort of enter your, your clubhouse. Have you had any issues with players coming down with the virus during the off season? And how do you expect the protocols to be similar or different than what you experienced uh, last summer as you go into spring training? To answer the first part, yes, uh, we, we, we have. And I'm sure that makes us just like every other club. Uh, it's, I mean, it is a, a, a raging pandemic. So we, we've, we've had it hit our doorstep and, and, uh, and probably continues to through our major and minor league clubs and, and staff. Uh, but how we anticipate that playing out in 21, we know that there will be you know, health and safety protocols in place. We believe that we learned a lot uh, in 2020 as a league on, on how best to manage it. We've also been able to, to observe the other major sports leagues and how they've handled it. And you know, when we started this, we, we were kind of first to flight. And, and you know, it, was a, it was a challenge you know, with, with us, with the NBA, having to figure out how to manage this type of, of health issue while the games go on. And, and I think MLB, the Players Association, did a phenomenal job of, of finding a resolution in 2020. And a lot of the protocols that we put into place will be replicated. And I'm sure that we're going to get guidance from, you know, health and safety uh, authorities that are going to point us in the right direction. What that looks like, I don't know. But we are prepared for what protocols look like today for the start of spring training. We have them in hand. We are, we are versed and ready to go. It looks a lot like it looked uh, for us at the, at the start of summer camp last year with, you know, a little bit more, uh, or I guess, a little bit less of a bubble format type feeling to it, but there's still going to be a lot of restrictions and, and that's justifiable based on where we are in terms of public health and safety. And our final question today from Chris Talbot. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, two questions, curious about vaccines, uh, just following up on Tim's question. And then could you talk about your relationship with uh, Scott, um, how you guys have evolved over the years are you in lockstep with all of these decisions? And I would think that it would be extremely stressful for a manager to churn so many players through over a two or three year period. So I wonder if you could talk about how he handles that as well. Sure. Uh, and I think the, the first, I'll go back. Chris, can you repeat the front end of that question one more time? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, you didn't mention vaccines and all the COVID questions. I'm just curious about how the team's handling that. Well, the team, we really don't handle vaccines. You know, we, we are, we'll wait for our turn in line. And that's going to be a state-by-state state decision. And we'll wait for Washington State and or Arizona State authorities to, you know, to tell us when it's our turn. It's, I think that's the appropriate way to, to respond. And we're not expecting as a sports league or even as the Mariners to, to jump the line. There's, uh, it's, that's, that, that's not how this will work. So, you know, we don't anticipate, nor are we expecting uh, any widespread access to, to vaccines before the start of spring training or really uh, anytime soon. So we'll wait until we're informed uh, at a higher level and, and go that route. As far as my relationship with Scott, I, I think I have a great relationship with Scott. You know, I, I believe in him. Uh, I believe in the, the direction that he takes the team. Are we in lockstep and agree with everything? No, <laughs> which I think makes us normal. You know, there's a, you know, he will disagree with something that, that I have in mind and vice versa. And, and that type of push and pull in any type of relationship, be it personal or professional, is, is required. You have to have that to be successful. And, you know, it, but we are in lockstep on what we believe in in terms of building culture, building clubhouse environments. You know, and, and, and from a baseball perspective, what we think, you know, what we think works in terms of how you score runs and, and the best way to achieve, you know, getting 27 outs a night. It's a, you know, to, to that end, you know, we agree, uh, uh, we agree on most baseball matters. You know, there are going to be personnel issues, lineup constructions, things where I defer to him and they're going to be player acquisition or roster building uh uh, I guess decisions where he's going to defer to me, and that's healthy. And there are going to be so there's going to be some white space in between where we just disagree, and and that's okay because you, if you don't have that, you really don't have a relationship. If you can't if you can't have that type of back and forth. 
Thank you, Jerry. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, both fans and media, for joining us today. A reminder that the bash rolls on for the next two weeks, uh, including at 1 o'clock today, we'll have a virtual clubhouse chat with Justice Sheffield and Nick Margavichus. 3 o'clock, there's a Twitter takeover with Taylor Trammell. 5 o'clock, you can check in on our community tour that Fred mentioned earlier with Ty France and Braden Bishop. And then at 7 tonight on ESPN 710, we will have the hot stove report. Our next media session will take place on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Same bat channel, same bat time. J.P. Crawford, Marco Gonzalez, and Kyle Seeger will be with us. And again, all these details are available on mariners.com slash baseball bash. Thanks again. Thank you for attending this morning's media session. Be sure to visit Mariners.com slash Baseball Bash for more fun.